Hello and welcome back to Murder Dictionary Podcast. I'm Brianna and that's Courtney. Hello. We're back. We made it. Welcome back. We're back. So before we get into the case that we're going to talk about tonight and we get to start a new letter, we always want to remind you that in the show notes you will find links to resources for our research material. So if you want to look into the case a little bit more, you can do a deeper dive. We'll always put the links there. We also have links to our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So if you want to follow us and find out when episodes are coming out, get some memes, some true crime info, updates on cases, all these random places that Courtney visits as far as crime scenes and Betty Broderick's house and stuff like that. You can find those links in our show notes. You will also find links to our Threadless where you can get some merch like t-shirts and mugs and tote bags and stuff like that. And we put links to resources for things like 12-step, domestic violence resources, um, anti-bullying, LGBTQ info. So if you want to check that out, check out our show notes. And the last thing we've got is the link to our Patreon. If you want to support the show, get access to bonus episodes, um, get access to some perks and stuff, then join our Patreon. And we want to thank the new people that are on our Patreon. Since we haven't been here for a little bit, I've got a list. And so I'm just going to do some of the names from the list. So if you don't hear your name and you signed up recently, we will get to you soon. I promise. Please don't yell at me. (laughs) You're coming down the line. (laughs) You're coming. You're in the queue, I promise. So, but this week, we want to say thank you to Kelly, Keisha, Pamela, Aurora, Trey, Anne, and Samantha. Thank you. So thanks, you guys. We really appreciate you being on our Patreon. And I know we've been gone for a while, but in our absence, we've been doing some research and writing and... I promise we will have some really intense bonus material coming to Patreon really soon. We got a lot. I've I've been really busy doing nothing but laying there with a laptop (laughs) on my lap somehow, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And you make it you make it sound like I'm just sitting outside Betty's old house. (laughs) No. I was in the area, okay? I went down to San Diego and I was there. And I just happened to think, gosh, when in Rome. Yeah, but the thing is, is like, we've got a few of those. We've got a few little inside pictures and info from local cases because you've visited certain places, you know, you happen to be around and you're a traveler. That's all I'm saying. I get around. You get the good pictures so people can have some context and know kind of what we're talking about when we describe certain things about the cases. I've got a few good ones coming, too. I remembered some places I've been, and I was like, do I still? Of course I still have the pictures in the video. So I've got a few places that we're going to visit together soon. Don't worry, don't you worry, folks. <laughs> so I think that's kind of pretty much it. I don't know. A lot of people have been, of course, checking on us because we've been gone for a bit, and they've been asking about Courtney, and I don't want to speak for you. So I don't know if you want to give a little update on how you're doing. I'm doing okay. I'm doing much better than I was. There, as always is with life, were many complications with my simple procedure. And uh, in times of COVID, of course, everything is much more complicated as it is. So I had an interesting window also into just the state of the healthcare system during COVID times. And it's all been very interesting. But um, we made it. Interesting is a polite word for it. Yeah, that really You've is. You've been through some things, and the good news is you're doing well, right? So Yeah. Yeah. I am. I've become slightly paranoid about certain things, but I think that's normal. I kind of feel like maybe there's some PTSD, but, you know, I, it was a very complicated situation. So as it is expected. what it is. It really yeah, you know, is. I think when you go through some really intense stuff, you get this heaviness that happens afterwards, you know? Yes. Uh, just, it's it's difficult. People think that like, okay, the doctor says you've got four weeks and then you're back on your feet. And it's just not that way emotionally. You may be physically feeling better, but it 
it takes the heart a minute to catch up. Yeah, just a few. <laughs> just a couple. But I mean, all in all, like I remember even when we were recording the last episode and people talking to me and telling me how, oh, how's your, it's going to be fine, all these things. And I just went along with it. Like, yeah, it's going to be fine. I, yeah. I just knew from the beginning <laughs> that nothing is easy. And I had a feeling. So I went into it typically, you know, not negative, but just aware. And so when I came out and was like, the next day, I was kind of like, oh, okay, that, that's what I figured, you know, <laughs> like, okay, I thought there'd be <laughs> I problems. This shit would hit the fan. Like, yeah. give me another shot and good night for days. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. And it's kind of funny because it's haha ha, funny. The um, case we're going to do tonight as I'm going through everything, I'm just like, oh, yeah, I'm totally paranoid about that now, too. Okay, cool. Yeah. Blood transfusions. Okay. Totally freaked out. Okay. Yeah. Right in line with what I'm experiencing. <laughs> so... Oh, Perfect man. I timing. have to tell you, yeah, this case researching this was a little bit rough for me. And there were points where I was like, I know this is hard for me. I think Courtney is going to have a hard time with this, too. You know what? But we're though? still doing it. We're you taking what, one though? for the team. There's no better time than now, right? Like, if yeah, we're going to do it, let's rip the bandaid off. Exposure therapy. That's what, that's this, what is. this is called. Okay, and, let's do it. You know, on on a personal note, I'm just I am very glad to be back. I'm really glad to be doing this with you. And it's one thing for us to be like catching up on the phone and texting and for us to like check in as friends, but I did really miss like talking true crime with you. So I'm really glad that we're back and I'm glad to have you. I've never been more hyped to be in the closet sweating for no reason. <laughs> I'm so excited to be back in the booth spitting hot fire. The You've no idea. Studio slash closet. <laughs> so hyped. So yeah, with that said, um, we can jump into the case that we're going to talk about tonight, and it's going to be a little bit different. I know I'm really bad at just giving like disclaimers before every single episode, but this one really does kind of require a disclaimer because it technically isn't a murder. And we don't normally cover cases that aren't a murder, but this one, since we're starting letter O, we've chosen to do organ theft. And this is an organ harvesting case where the victims are all deceased, but that still doesn't mean we don't have a pretty gnarly criminal doing some very scary stuff, I would say. Let's be real here. If there's a dead body, there can still be a crime. Yes. We can still report on this death, even if the nature of the death is not the motive. What? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> it's a byproduct. There's death involved. Right. Here we are to talk about it. And it is kind of a complicated case because, I mean, on some levels, it, this uh, person is kind of similar to like a Dr. Kevorkian figure where some people may agree with what he did and think that it's kind of for the greater good. I don't necessarily think I'm one of those people, but, you know, we'll get into the case and you guys can decide how you feel. Yeah. The ends don't justify the means always. Right. So before we get into the person that we're covering this week, let's just kind of talk about organ theft, organ harvesting, transplants, stuff like that. I've got a little bit of general info and I've got even more next week too. So you guys kind of have some context because this is something that I don't necessarily know a lot about and I don't think the average person does because you don't really know this info until you're in that situation where you need tissue, where you need an organ. You know, it's not common knowledge. A hundred percent. Right. So although, you know, we chose organ theft for letter O and there's a lot of urban legends out there, it's just extremely difficult and even, let's say, impossible to really find a verifiable case of specific organ theft, like a one-on-one -on -one murder type situation. Most of them are more like this case that we're going to talk about where it's um, people that are taking tissue and organs for transplants on a mass scale from cadavers. That's way more common. One of the biggest issues that's fueling the black market for organs is the fact that there are not enough donor organs to meet the demand of people that really need transplants. So there are only 25,000 donors a year 
to supply more than a million tissue transplants. Those numbers don't work. No, not at all. And, you know, from a single body, you can take multiple things, but there's just way too many people on the list that need organs and tissues that just 25,000 is not enough. The majority of illegal organs taken from living people are kidneys. And that's kind of not what we're talking about, but this is generally the urban legend is that someone's going to steal a kidney, right? Well, that's the one I know, we all hear of. As soon as we were like, oh, it's for organ theft, I immediately went, oh, yeah, okay, wake up in a bath full of ice, missing your kidney. Like, I've seen right. that CSI. We've all seen, you know, and God was that just not the way the real world works. And it really just brought me to tears. Yeah, if you try and look it up, I mean, there is nothing out there. And I challenge you guys as listeners, if you can find something, send it our way this week and we will definitely look it in, look into it and, you know, possibly do an episode on that. But we really couldn't find anything. This oh. is really urban legend, straight up urban legend. Please send it to me. Yes. <laughs> I'm I'm challenging you, please. And also, if you find a dentist that just straight murders someone in a chair, I'm still looking for this. Please send it our way. We will do an episode <laughs> on it. If it's if it's legitimately backed up, I got you. Right. And it's just it's almost impossible. It's we just haven't been able to find them. But that's where the urban legend lies. So if we look at specifically kidneys in the US, there are over a hundred thousand people waiting for specifically kidney transplants, but only 15 to 20,000 transplants take place annually. So again, those numbers just don't add up. So because of the lack of supply, 4,761 Americans die waiting for kidney transplants in 2015. Wow. And so that's just every year, just more and more people. It's unbelievable. The World Health Organization estimates that 10,000 kidneys are traded on the black market worldwide annually, or more than one every hour. Wow. Crazy, right? That's a stat. The wait for a kidney in the U.S. averages three and a half years. In Canada, it's about four years, and in the U.K., the average is two and a half years. A new person is added to the organ transplant list every 10 minutes, and approximately 20 people die every day while waiting for an organ. Oh, this is bleak. It is. No, it's just these are the stats that kind of lead to the desperation of people either engaging in the black market or someone like the person that we're talking about tonight that takes organs that aren't necessarily on the up and up, let's say. So one of the people that was just looking to take advantage of this just desperate need for donors and turn other people's need into profit was Michael Mastro Marino, a.k.a. The Brooklyn Body Snatcher. Michael was born in Brooklyn on September 16th, 1963. He was from a middle class family who had very high expectations that their son would just be good at school, be good at sports, and pursue a stable career. Basically be a man's man, right? Yeah. From an early age, people described him as very smart and confident. He was not only a great student, but also an athlete who did fairly well on his football team. So far, so good. It seems like when you look into his childhood, there's really nothing crazy that happens. There's nothing extreme. We don't see, you know, these signs that are scary, you know, yeah. these signs of like a horror filled childhood, you know. Michael, however, was always concerned with status and success above anything else. It was all keeping up appearances and doing better than other people. After high school, he graduated from the University of Pittsburgh, then went to New York University for dentistry before doing his residency in New York. While he was in school, he would often visit a tanning salon. Here we go. A 
<laughs> again, he's very <laughs> vain. He's very interested in, you know, looking the part. Is he friends with Dan Broderick? Because Dan <laughs> Broderick is probably at Cornell <laughs> or at least at the Alumni Association functions. That's what I was thinking when I was researching this. I was like, he is a little bit of a Dan Broderick character. He needs to be, you know, nice suits, looking good, fresh tan. He was very sporty, very active. He wanted people to perceive him as that that guy, you know, oh, yeah. all-American country club guy. Going to the tanning salon. Right. <laughs> So while he was going and visiting this tanning salon, he developed a crush on one of the girls who worked there named Barbara Refill, despite the fact that he already had a girlfriend. Hmm. So initially, Barbara wasn't sure what to make of this mysterious customer, and she actually first thought that he might have been a bodyguard for a mobster. Oh, Barb, in your imagination. But that honestly, it kind of gives you a a sense of what he looked like, right? It also kinda, gives you a, a sense little bit of Jersey what... Shore, I think. Yes, it gives you a sense also of like what Barb is into. <laughs> like first <laughs> she thing went you for think? it. Yeah. First thing. <laughs> so she recalls that he was the strong, silent type, saying, "Quote: He had an amazing presence." I had chills. I couldn't <laughs> stop thinking about him. And he obviously couldn't stop thinking about me. I had chills. <laughs> what? Uh, it's funny how you striking someone can be when they just don't say anything stupid. You know, <laughs> like, oh my God, if you right. just don't open your mouth, then you won't screw yourself. <laughs> He's an intellectual. <laughs> right? People think you're so interesting. And so enigmatic if you just stay quiet. <laughs> I need to take a hint here. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, my God. My head exploded. <laughs> so only a few weeks after meeting, Michael decided to break up with his girlfriend and immediately ask Barbara out to dinner. Sure. He just, yeah, he was like, I'm done with her. This is my new target. The best way to get over someone is to get under someone else, as they say. Hey Ayo. <laughs> so <laughs> they started dating and she believed that he was the perfect guy. And it's very clear to me, like she put him on a pedestal from the very beginning. He could do no wrong. I agree. Yeah, that's that's what I'm picking up. And I kind of of course, I think, you know, we always talk about the family members and loved ones being additional victims. But I just think she was so extremely codependent that it, it made her especially susceptible to believing certain lies or just seeing him in a certain light and just having those rose-tinted glasses on and always thinking the best of him, even if he wasn't necessarily having the best of intentions. I agree. Yeah. So over time, she, of course, fell in love with him, and she described Michael as her soulmate. They got married in 1992, and people close to them thought that they were so perfect that they actually nicknamed them Ken and Barbie. It's not always the greatest thing in true crime to be called Ken and Barbie. I know. It's just a bad sign. When people think you're that perfect, there's just something under the surface that's going to crack. I'm going to insert footnote to the Ken and Barbie killers, Paul Bernardo and Carla Hermolka. Mm-hmm. Definitely, Who? when you think something like that, there's something wrong. I, sorry, last week I saw something that she was in trouble because she was volunteering at her children's school. Just FYI. Like, just yeah. like a year ago, she like got it's in trouble. It's been in the news recently. Like, okay. She's just making trying sure. to be around kids and that, no, 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 no. Nope. Okay. So no. anyway, sorry, back to Michael. <laughs> I just had to warn everybody that Carla's trying to babysit. Right. If you're in the area of Carla Homolka, just look out for your kids. So after they were married, Michael became an extremely successful dentist who specialized in maxillofacial surgery. He was so successful that eventually he had two busy offices running in both New Jersey and Midtown Manhattan. And 
he was really known for taking on these cases that were especially difficult or that other doctors either could or would not do. He was definitely the specialist that was kind of the last house on the block. Like, he would do anything, even if it was risky. Michael became such an expert in his field that he co-authored a book with Michael R. Weiland called Smile, How Dental Implants Can Transform Your Life. I've seen so many dental implant commercials in the last two months, but they really, really can. Oh, God, yes. Smile, correct, and dental land, and fucking implant this in your face, and oh, I was so sad. I got out of prison. I had no teeth, and now I do. They can change your life. Yeah, it definitely makes a big difference. I mean, the work that he was doing was making a lot of patients really happy to just be able to smile and show their teeth. And I think there's a lot of people living with that issue where they're ashamed and he was helping them. So in the book, Michael explains that as the life expectancy of humans increases, our body parts are more prone to wear out, basically. And that we're fortunate to be living in what he described as the, quote, new age of implantology. The book says, quote, just as orthopedists replace hips, knees, shoulders, etc., dentists replace teeth with implants. And this is kind of an insight to basically you can tell he's kind of OK with taking pieces and putting together humans like puzzles, right? Yeah, seems to be fine with it. Right. Michael's largest contribution to the book was on the subject of bone grafting, which he explained had seen great advances in technology and were therefore much easier and less painful than they used to be. The book said, quote, breakthroughs in tissue engineering have come to the rescue, and today we can literally put bone wherever we need it. That's what she said. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not I good at dick entirely jokes. entirely too much of the office. <laughs> I'm not good at dick jokes, but you handed me that one. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking that, so I'm, I'm glad you seized that opportunity. <laughs> I've, I've been working in the office, just so you know. Like, they, they just see me now, and they're fine with it. As he became more successful professionally, Michael upgraded to this big house in Fort Lee, New Jersey, complete with an Escalade and Lincoln in the driveway. It's clear that his obsession with keeping up appearances extended to maintaining this look of having a really, you know, big house and a perfect family and country club membership and all that kind of stuff. His family grew also when Barbara gave birth to sons Michael and Gerald, who they called Jerry. Although it looked like Michael had everything going for him, both in his professional and personal life, cracks began to start showing in the late 90s. Michael suffered from a persistent backache, which he says resulted from an old sports injury, So he began taking Demerol for the pain. But it wasn't long, of course, before he developed a habit. I've also heard people say that he had slipped and fallen and it had aggravated his back. And I think maybe they were both incidents that caused him pain initially. But once he was on the pain medication, he just really couldn't control it, you know? Yeah. Like, he's been prescribing it for a long time and, like, hearing people talk about, like, he knows what, I mean, you know, he he knows what he's doing. He knew what he was getting himself into. He's a dentist. When you give people pain medication that often, you know that there's a certain risk of developing a habit, you know? Yeah. And who knows if he knew if he was more susceptible to it, if he had maybe addiction in his family, you know, if there was something like that, you know? Or if he was just knew from the beginning that he was doing it to get high, but he had an excuse of having a back problem, we'll just never know. I feel like a bitch right now because I'm like, you know, oh, well, he knew he was getting into. But I'm just thinking about it like this way. Demerol is the first thing we go to. Like, you know what I mean? That's... (laughs) It's it's, telling. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, ibuprofen regimen that we know of, I guess, right? Like, 
Yeah, kind we of don't being an really asshole. know the process. But, okay, continue. <laughs> so in 1998, while on a family vacation, Michael's mother found him passed out in their hotel bathroom. Hmm. He made the excuse that he had slipped and fallen and hurt his back, so he was taking Demerol so he could sleep. He, you know, apologized to everybody for the scare that he caused, and he said he just only accidentally used a little bit too much and that he would see a doctor when they got back home. But of course, he didn't follow through on that promise. By 1999, employees at his practice began noticing that he just didn't seem like himself. At first, you know, people just thought he seemed a little tired, but very quickly it escalated and people began to see that he was really out of it. Very groggy, not fully coherent, just not not with it. Oh my God. Which is especially scary because we know that he's performing surgeries. He is a specialist that performs surgeries on people's faces. Oh. That's terrifying. This is me and Courtney's worst nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is every time that I hear I have to have a new surgery, this is what I what I envision is like the anesthesiologist is out of it, the surgeon is out of it, that they don't know what's going on and something bad's going to happen. They're this all on the Demerol. Nightmare. Right, exactly. <laughs> so Michael's staff, who would assist him during procedures, began to worry because even while he was in surgery, he seemed groggy and sweaty and just not 100%. The sweat's going to give you away every time, dude. Yeah, if you see someone sweating, there's a problem. <laughs> and like, not sweaty like you're, you're at, like sweaty like there's an issue. Sweaty like it's 60 degrees in a hospital and your skin is gray and you're still sweating? That's Yeah, that kind of sweat. That's the one. You're, yeah. You know. <laughs> that one. One time, his dental assistant even noticed that he was asleep and he had nodded off while working on a patient. So she tapped him to wake him up and he finished the procedure. Mm, 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 mm. That's so terrifying. That's so scary. (sighs) A short (laughs) while later, there was another incident in his office where he collapsed while leaving the restroom with his pants still around his ankles. Oh, my God. It keeps going, though, too. (laughs) Another day, his staff could not find him, and they eventually realized again that he was in the bathroom. So they got into the bathroom, opened it up, and found him unconscious and bleeding on the bathroom floor with a needle sticking out of his arm. As you do. It's unbelievable. I he mean, likes just... to sleep in the bathroom. <laughs> Isn't that weird? He takes Don't naps we all? Don't in the bathroom, all? on the floor. <laughs> I, I can say, <laughs> as someone who's familiar with opiate addiction... Let's put that in a, in a very PC way. Um, I mean, that's what you do. You go to the restroom because it's the only place with privacy. You can't like sit in the break room while everybody's eating their lunch and shoot up, you know. So, of course, you go to the restroom and you try and make it seem like you're just doing restroom business while you use your drugs. That's, you know, the nature of opiate addiction. It's very solitary and often takes place in in restrooms. You see this you know? a lot on a uh, A&E's intervention as well. <laughs> <laughs> they film in a bathroom a lot. Yes, yes. So I mean this was pretty normal I think for someone that's developed an opioid addiction, you know? It's just that the first time it happened it really should have been reported. I just can't believe that, you know, we're starting in 1998, then there's incidents in 1999, 2000, he's still performing surgery. It's just way too much. I think it's it's absolutely terrifying to me that he wasn't reported sooner. You know? Yeah. There really shouldn't have been more than one incident. You know, he should have gone to rehab immediately. <sighs> Get ready for the tastiest breakfast under the sun. New Jimmy Dean Casserole Bites. 
all the homemade flavors of a breakfast casserole packed into a poppable bite. And you know something else? They taste good. So in the most recent incidents that I was talking about where he was found with a needle bleeding on the bathroom floor, what was going on at the time that he had nodded off was he had left a patient unconscious under anesthesia waiting for him on the operating table. Wow. It's unbelievable to me. I I just... I can't imagine waking up to like hearing, oh, yeah, the doctor couldn't finish it because, you know, he was nodding off in the bathroom, you know? It's like you come out of surgery just to immediately call whatever attorney is available. Right. Absolutely. (laughs) Something has to happen. Like somebody somebody's got to stop him. Yeah, of course. This just can't continue. People are going to get seriously injured. By early 2000, employees began telling his wife, Barbara, what they had seen. They also mentioned that he had also brought a few women around that seemed to be more than friends. And Barb just tried to shrug this off and keep going as usual. She never confronted him about it. She just tried to keep her family together. In late June of 2000... Michael performed a truly disastrous procedure that damaged patient Anna Ortiz's seventh cranial nerve, which left her with a permanent droop on the left side of her face. Ugh. Oh, man. Um, that, that is my nightmare right there. <laughs> that yeah. is absolutely my nightmare. I had, on one of my surgeries, I had damage to my sixth cranial nerve, So for a period of time (laughs) before they fixed everything, my left eye just kind of always looked down into the side. (laughs) So crazy. So you just don't realize how extremely delicate the really small areas behind your face and near your brain are until something goes terribly wrong. And I guess, I mean... Maybe that's just my experience. It's really that way with the entire body. But I mean, everything is so fragile. And so, you know, reading that about what happened to Anna Ortiz, it's just like, I mean, she's left with permanent damage. I mean, that's forever. I I mean, I feel lucky that my sixth cranial nerve was able to be repaired. But otherwise, I'd be walking around with my eye patch still on, you know, with an eye looking all the way to the left you know (laughs) like this is something that's just it's just so sad she trusted her doctor and then he did her wrong i do remember this story because you were telling me you wore an eye patch when your nerve was damaged (laughs) and i was just completely blown i'm like you went in for for what again and your (laughs) eye didn't work it's just this guy he's dr death if you haven't heard the podcast listen like he's just yeah too much He's a disaster. He's going to end up killing somebody. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just (laughs) I did wear an eye patch for a while. And like, I mean, I thought that I could just get through it, you know, but I mean, there's just so much little fragile stuff going on in your face that that's, you know, it was only a matter of time before he damaged someone like this, really. So 10 days after this crazy incident, Michael didn't come home, and Barbara began to worry. So at about midnight, she decided to put her sons in the car and just drive around looking for him. It wasn't long before she found flashing lights and noticed Michael standing next to his car on the side of the road. She started yelling for him, but suddenly she realized that he wasn't alone in the car. Barbara says, quote, that's when I first found out that he had cheated on me. I didn't want to believe it. I was shattered. That's the first time it was confirmed with her eyes. Right. This was not the first time that she found... She... No, there's no way. And people for sure had been tell. I mean, she said that... Or they said that the girls the dental assistants were trying to tell her she just couldn't hear it it wasn't until she saw it that she could hear her ears worked once her eyes worked 
<laughs> you know, she'd been hearing That's the about the right way this. to put it. Yeah, yeah she'd been hearing about it. It's just something she wasn't willing to accept. She just was in such denial about the drug use, about women. She couldn't really fathom that her husband would do this. So Michael was arrested for possession of Demerol, hypodermic needles, and being under the influence of a controlled substance. It's about time. Like, somebody needs to stop yes. him from doing something because he thinks he's invincible. He really does. And people are getting hurt and it just needs to come to an end. His wife, Barbara, said, quote, when you're in a marriage and you're so in love with someone, you always want to see the best in them. It's very, very hard to see the bad when it happens. You kind of brush it off like, oh, no, couldn't be that. Until, of course, the big moment where I realized that things were terribly wrong when I learned he was a drug addict and cheating. Hmm. So after the car accident, he was arrested, but eventually the charges were dropped. He was required to submit to drug testing, and when he failed the year analysis, the dentistry board had to get involved. So Michael agreed to give up his license for six months with the condition that he attend a drug treatment program and then hopefully he would go back to practicing again. However, he continued to practice dentistry while his license was suspended. And when he was caught, Michael was ordered to cease practicing dentistry for the next four years. Six months, that's it. All you had to do was... Hold it together. And he's been a really good, like, functioning drug addict at this point. I mean, he hasn't killed anyone yet, right? So that's pretty good. (laughs) So, like, six months. That's it. All you got to do is take six months off and just keep it cool, you know? Right. But no, you want to do a cleaning or, you know what I mean, sell some Demerol to someone or something and let him in the (laughs) office. And now it's four years. Yeah. He really, he could have just rode the time out gotten his shit together, gotten back on his feet, done the rehab, and, you know, continued some therapy. He could have turned around his entire life in that six months. And Lord knows he has the money and he's got other people working under him to continue his practice. You know what I mean? Like, he's well established. He still would have had an income even if he wasn't performing his surgeries, you know? A hundred percent. And, you know, he could have even just... You know, I don't know, just like six months is not a long time no. to just kind of lay low. And like I said, he could have kept doing whatever the hell he was up to. Right. But he just don't tell me what to do so badly. Right. Yep. He thinks he can get away with anything. Yeah. So after he lost his license, Michael did four separate stints in rehab over the next 12 months. Just in and out. Don't tell yep. me what to do. Yep. Just completely defiant. And I I mean, I know it is extremely difficult to get sober, extremely difficult to get clean. It, I don't take that lightly at all. And a lot of people do more than one time in rehab. A lot of people don't, you know, it just doesn't take immediately. And that's okay. But I think he is particularly that type of person that's just very defiant, doesn't want to follow the rules, doesn't want to go with the program. He's not willing to really look inside and go deep to kind of heal from whatever the things are that are making him want to use drugs, you know? Yeah, he he's wasn't have ready. To, he has to hit rock bottom a few times. A few. Just hit his head against that wall a few Couple times. more times. A short while later, Michael's disfigured patient, Anna Ortiz, sued him, and the malpractice lawsuit was later settled out of court. By all accounts, he did manage to get sober eventually, later on, but it was a little bit too late. I mean, hey, good for him. Yeah, I mean, it's except for he just clearly didn't become a better person. <laughs> Because we haven't even got to the bad, bad, bad stuff. You didn't even ask him to be a better person. We just asked him to go to rehab and get sober. Yes, that's true. That's all the dentistry board really wanted. (laughs) Although Barbara felt like she should leave her husband, she decided to give Michael a second chance in hopes of keeping their family intact. She was very clearly trying to keep her boys 
in a stable home. Yeah. Michael needed to keep providing for his family, of course, and he wanted to keep up this affluent lifestyle that he built for himself. So he knew that he had to find another source of substantial income. He decided to look to his network to find a new career path, and among his previous professional contacts was one of the largest tissue banks in the country called Regeneration Technologies Incorporated, or RTI. RTI is a Florida-based company known for manufacturing things like injectable bone paste, demineralized bone matrix, cortical bone pins, and bone dowels, among many other things. Gross. <laughs> it all just sounds like Halloween decorations. Yeah, this is this is the part where, you know, I mean, if if body stuff and that all is hard for you, I understand if this isn't the best episode for you to listen to, but that's what they were doing. And these things are very necessary. These things are life-changing and life-saving for people. I am not particularly a person that likes to hear a lot about medical stuff, but I know that this makes a difference in people's lives, you know? From Michael's previous surgical practice, he was aware that RTI needed suppliers of human body parts to keep their business running. And of course, he thought that he would be a good fit for working in the field of implants, but from the opposite direction as a supplier. So this was kind of the complete 180 from what he was doing before where he was installing implants. Now he would be kind of retrieving them for people. He decided to contact RTI to see if he could get a contract with them, and he assured them that he could do a much better job since, of course, he was a surgeon who was familiar with using their materials before. All right, let's try something new. I like right? it. I like it. Let's do a 180 and turn our life around. It sounds good. I like it. Until it doesn't sound good. You what know? do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> We're on letter O, so no, I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. um, so only a short time after he had completely lost his dental license, he was relicensed in New York to supply tissue banks and manufacturers of biological surgical instruments. Okay, I feel like that should be a requirement that you can't really get a license for this other thing if you just lost a license for something else, right? Am well, I crazy to think they should do a background check? Yeah, but I mean, I would bet that like the dental board and the organ board are totally separate. It's not like CODIS, you know. Where of course, all yeah, they're not talking to each other. But I just yeah. feel like something of that magnitude in the medical profession, I, I just feel like you should do a background check. We're not talking about a cosmetology board. You know what I mean? No, definitely not. Uh, <laughs> they should be doing that. But this he this is why I hate doing what we do, because now it's like, oh, well, that's not standard. And now I have to sleep with that. Right. Now you know? I know that. Now this I know happen. that. And yeah. I have to live with it. <laughs> so just for some kind of background information, harvesting organs, tissue, bone, etc. is completely legal but highly regulated within the stipulations like donor consent, age requirements, and ensuring the donor does not carry any communicable disease. So these donations have to pass a very, you know, a lot of different requirements. On top of that, you also can't supply organs for profit in the U.S. So the company like RTI can't actually profit beyond recouping their expenses. So any money that is exchanged is for things like storage, transport, to removing the organs like the operation. That's all the, the money that they can exchange for it. We can't really charge people for organs in the U.S. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, I get it. That makes perfect sense. Great Sorry, explanation. Sorry, that was like a roundabout way of no. saying that. <laughs> no, great explanation. Beyond these initial requirements, even if the deceased has signified consent on their driver's license, many states, including New York, where Michael was, also require permission from the family. Even if the person that has passed 
signify that they're a donor. Hmm. Yeah, I, I did not know that at all. That's weird. That was very new information for me. Every tissue or sample has to be harvested within 24 hours of death or 15 hours if the body is stored in an uncooled facility. That's a horror movie in its own right, by the way. Just I know. bodies being stored in uncooled facilities. Chaos ensues. Yes. And that's just... <laughs> oh, man, it's such a horror. <laughs> it is. It makes <laughs> Because it makes me think that's just for har harvesting organs. That means that there's definitely, they're sitting around for way longer without the organs being harvested. You know what I mean? A body that's not a donor. You just kind of sit around for days. And who knows what the cooling situation is. Eek. Yeah. Mm. I'm inside. I'm just trying to suppress the gag. So. Yeah. It's, this is just a lot of tough information. There are approximately 25,000 donors a year to supply more than a million needed tissue transplants. And that's something I kind of touched on in the beginning. So there's definitely a high demand. Since there are nowhere near enough consenting donors to fulfill the demand for tissue, Michael saw this as an opportunity to make some money. Although full organs are in extremely high demand, there are also so many other parts of the body which can be used to help patients in need. Bone can be used to repair fractures or, or perform spinal fusions. Veins for heart bypass surgery. Tendons and ligaments can restore mobility. Corneas can repair vision. Membrane around the heart can be used in neurosurgery. Membrane around the muscles of the thigh can sling up sagging bladders to control incontinence. Cartilage can be used in facial reconstruction. Skin can be used for burn survivors. And of course, collagen can be used in cosmetic procedures. Huh. Michael knew that when using as many parts of the body as possible, the profit from one body can reach six figures. Wow. I know. 90% of harvesting happens in hospitals, but 10% of organ harvesting does happen in funeral homes. And this is really for people who pass away at home or maybe pass away in a smaller facility like a rehabilitation center or an old folks home, you know, something like that. So Michael saw this also as an opportunity to operate outside hospitals. He began seeking out undertakers and funeral homes who would help provide him with fresh bodies, which he offered to pay $1,000 for. Well, sure, sir. You just right? walked right up into my building. You've never been here and I don't know you, but let me just hand you bodies. I'm sure I'll take a G each. Sounds great. It's all it, this whole thing. I swear you made this up. Like no, it's <laughs> yeah, <you> absolutely <laughs> boggling. Like this story is just. I can't even believe that someone went through all this and so many people were complicit. That's the thing that that drives me absolutely crazy. That so many people, you know let him practice dentistry for a couple of years where he could have seriously damaged many more people. And then so many people let him just take bodies. You know, I, I just don't understand. This is what it's not like a typical murder case when we talk about someone doing something in secret and nobody knows and they do everything to cover their tracks. This really blows my mind because so many people did know that Michael was a shitty guy doing awful things that are completely dangerous and unethical. And so many people just turned a blind eye or said, yeah, let me help you. All right, here we go, though. And I'm just real quick and then move forward because I could do this <laughs> for way too long. But like, 
the person you're looking for, the dudes at Lincoln and Schmidt, who are just like, yeah, this is a great idea. This is a good plan. You know, right. these are these guys are not doing background checks or caring about the dentistry CODIS versus their CODIS, right? Like, yeah, they're taking the G out the back and like putting him in a red flyer wagon, you know, <laughs> like to move yeah. him around. I just, again, that you have to go like he's doing a scam. He's looking for scammers. He knows what's up. He knows who he's looking for. It's true. It's totally true. And that's exactly what he was doing. I mean, just by all accounts, he was preying on these low income areas or, you know, people that were below the poverty line, people that were going to funeral homes that maybe were offering deals. And he was dealing with funeral homes that were generally not operating on the up and up to begin with, you know. So Michael specifically sought out funeral homes in these low income areas with marginalized clientele, because in these businesses specifically, it was extremely common for families to receive upgrades or discounts when they allowed their loved one's organs to be harvested. One of the facilities he used in Harlem advertised, quote, the highest quality services at the lowest rates and offered cremations for under $600. Oof. Yeah. Early on, Michael's best body supplier was the Daniel George and Son Funeral Home in Bensonhurst, owned by Joe Nicelli. The first floor was an unassuming funeral home, but there was a trap door and a hydraulic lift that led to a secret room on the second floor where there was a fully functioning operating room with specialized surgical equipment for organ harvesting. Ah. <laughs> Nightmare fuel. It's like J Johnny Depp's character in the movie Sleepy Hollow. This is his dream home. <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh. <laughs> yep. My skin is crawling. <laughs> yeah, bad news. <laughs> Once he found a few funeral homes like this and undertakers to supply him with bodies, he founded a business which he called Biomedical Tissue Services. BTS. <laughs> <laughs> Although he may have initially only harvested according to regulation, we're, we're really not sure we... We can't be positive about this. After a little while, he started to instruct the funeral homes to use everything they could and ignore any and all restrictions. The funeral homes were, of course, complicit by supplying bodies that they knew were ineligible or didn't have consent just so that they could collect that $1,000 fee. Mm. Yeah. It wasn't long before the funeral homes were supplying more bodies than Michael had time to retrieve tissue from. <laughs> <laughs> the only one with this problem. Unbelievable. He put word out amongst his medical contacts that he was looking for an assistant at his new company. Word reached a nurse at Beth Israel Medical Center named Lee Crusetta, who needed to bring in some extra cash because his wife had recently lost her job and they had four kids to support. Lee also had previous experience working at a tissue bank, but he'd never worked in a funeral home before. Even with this new person, Lee, coming aboard to help Michael, he still didn't have enough time, so he brought on a funeral director named Chris Alderasi to complete even more harvesting. A third employee was hired to assist the people operating on the bodies by bagging and labeling the tissues. And then he brought in a fourth person just for the fingertips. Like, what? Oh, my God, how many people? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's They're crazy. Just, this is the thing that blows my mind about this whole ordeal is there's so many people that knew what was going on and didn't do anything. Yeah. I just, it breaks my heart. Michael called his assistants cutters. And even though he had multiple employees now, 
there were still more bodies than any of them had time for. Michael's network of funeral directors were supplying bodies nonstop so that they could, of course, collect their $1,000 fee. The assistant, Lee, was doing up to 25 harvests a month and earning a base salary plus $200 to $300 additional bonus per harvest. Oh my God. Right? <laughs> Lee estimates that Michael was bringing in about ten dollars to $15,000 per body, but later on his lawyers would claim that he earned only $7,000 per body at most. Well, he's making five grand a week low end. It's just so <laughs> either way. It's just it doesn't. He's yeah, he's just crazy, right? Absolutely robbing these people. And and yeah, it's unbelievable to me. So either way, Michael was earning at least a million dollars a year living in a mansion and spending on luxurious things like a heated driveway so he didn't have to shovel any snow. That just makes sense. <laughs> it's practical, yet it's frivolous, you know? <laughs> I would rather have a heated driveway and drive like a buggy, you know, if I lived out there. <laughs> like, like a horse and buggy? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like for my buggy. What do you mean? <laughs> However, I know that the Escalade and the Lincoln are what, you know, possible navigator are what's parked there. Right. Absolutely. One of the reasons the business was so booming and there were so many bodies being harvested was because Michael had communicated to his network of funeral homes that he did not care about meeting the criteria for acceptable donor bodies. In order to increase his profits, Michael would use tissue from people with cancer, HIV, and other communicable diseases, or beyond the age requirements. Ah, oh, wow. Yeah. So now it's beginning to become more clear as to why there were so many bodies. Because mm -hmm. you've got to think, uh, it's just, they really should only be harvesting young people with no medical conditions that have given consent. And that's not enough people. If we've already seen the statistics that there's only 25,000 donors per year, we know that there's way too many people coming through these funeral homes that yeah. don't line up with that statistic. His company, Biomedical Tissue Services, also accepted bodies that were not being stored in cooling facilities were harvested without meeting sterile workplace regulations, and bodies that had been deceased beyond the 15 to 24 hour deadline. Michael even harvested organs and tissue from bodies without consent from the individuals or their family members. To ensure the paperwork appeared to be on the up and up, Michael would forge death certificates to change the cause of death, lower their age to acceptable donor level. He also forged paperwork that gave consent from the deceased and or their next of kin. In order to get around the fact that family members had not given consent, if there was a family that wanted to have a viewing, they would do things like carefully take maybe leg bones from the hip to the foot. They would then replace the bones with PVC pipes and sew up the legs. Then the body looked natural with pants on for the funeral. And this is something that I was not aware of, but this is actually a common practice for a couple reasons. This is common in cases where maybe someone had an accident. So let's say someone died on their motorcycle. They may use PVC pipe to kind of reconstruct a little bit. Or for someone who actually legally consented and was meeting all the criteria of a donor and said, I want to give my body parts, they may take a leg bone and put a PVC pipe in there. However, none of these people were consenting and did not meet the criteria. 
Oh, there's so much. There's just so much disgustingness. Like, I I knew, you know, oh, he was in a motorcycle accident. Perfect example. Lost his leg. We put in a pipe so they can have a viewing. I mean, I get that. But right. when you just lay that all out and the way, oh, God. Right. When Ugh. a family thinks that, you know, we're having a viewing and, and they're under the belief that their loved one is fully intact I know that on some level, maybe it doesn't make a difference to some people because the person's already gone. But for a lot of people, that's extremely traumatic and damaging to find out, oh, the whole time my loved one was stuffed with PVC and God knows what, you know? And I know that there was somebody at that funeral like me who would just look a little too closely. You know what I mean? Like right. some they're they're making they're so cavalier that they're bound. They had to have messed up. You know, somebody noticed somebody maybe didn't say anything right there, but there's there's people paying attention in ways. There you know, there's gotta be. Like it's right. just with the amount of people they're going through and bodies that they're going through, bound to be messed up. Somewhere somebody messed up. Absolutely. There's definite signs that things were not right at these funeral homes or with these bodies. They were also like they filled, you know, bags with saline sometimes if they took an organ out to just make it not look like there was something missing. I mean, they did all sorts of stuff. And these families just had no idea. People just thought their loved ones weren't missing any parts. And they later on would find out if they had gone through this funeral home, that that just wasn't the case. So that's for the families who had viewings or, you know, in that sort of situation. But for the families who had planned cremation, the biomedical tissue services team would completely go all out with harvesting as much as they could and even using power tools because they didn't have to worry about making a mess or preserving appearances. Wow. Yeah. They just took everything they could. So these bodies would then be just put into cardboard boxes and sent to the crematorium in just pieces. Every time I hear about a crematorium, I just am immediately transported to the scene in the movie, the Christmas film Scrooged, where Bill Murray is being cremated and Wendy Malick is a sister-in-law crying and the brother crying. And that is to me, like, I've, that's when I think of a crematorium, that crazy weird metal or a marble room. That's what I think of. So I'm just thoroughly freaked out right now. I think that that um, movie was a little bit scarring if you saw it at too young of an age. I remember distinctly feeling very uncomfortable watching that movie (laughs) i remember my parents like we owned the vhs and watched it like year round oh yeah bill murray's a big deal bill murray was a big deal in my house too i totally get it and i I was freaked out yeah christmas is coming okay (laughs) at their philadelphia funeral home they didn't even put the bodies in boxes they just used cloth to stop the bleeding and avoid leaving a trail of blood Then they took the stretcher directly to cremation. Don't worry, just throw some more sawdust over on that section. Yeah, I mean, they just weren't doing any. I mean, they were just just piles of of remains that were stripped of all usable parts. I, I mean, it's heartbreaking and devastating. I can't imagine. And the kind of callousness that you have to have to do this to people without consent. And it just breaks my heart. In 2005, people began noticing that something was off at the Daniel George and Son Funeral Home in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. So they began kind of investigating and looking into it a little bit further. The neighbors surrounding the Daniel George Funeral Home didn't know the full story about the organ harvesting, but they could tell that remains were definitely not being handled properly and that the business was not meeting sanitation standards, to put it mildly. A neighbor named Kathleen Donahue recalls that you could hear, quote, banging and clanging at all hours of the day and night. It's the ghosts rattling the chains that live in the <laughs> attic. What are you talking about? Oh, they're, God. They, there's so many of them now. They're just like, we got to get out of here. 
There were vans coming and going again at all hours and employees would even leave a couple body bags on the sidewalk unattended for periods of time. Unbelievable. Like this is a neighborhood and they're just leaving not a lot of people were saying like not just one, but like a couple body bags out there because it was the assumption being it was so full inside the funeral home that they didn't even have room to bring them in until they processed more bodies, you know? Oh, it's so awful. Right? A woman in the neighborhood to, who declined to be publicly identified said the funeral home operated like an overflowing factory. In the mornings, there would be plastic trash bags on the sidewalks and the neighborhood animals would get into them, scattering bloody cotton swabs, surgical gloves, and soiled aprons out into the street. It's time to move. Oh, it's, I mean, it's time to report them. Like, Jesus, this is crazy. I just want to move. Well, yeah, that too. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think I could move into that neighborhood to begin with. Like, oh, there's a funeral home next door? Hard pass. No, thank you. The neighbor said, quote, it was just a total lack of respect for the neighborhood, the families, and the deceased. Around this time, there began to be reports of health issues after transplants, including a woman named Dana Ryan, who contracted hepatitis after a transplant. So things began to kind of unravel. The neighbors were noticing things. There was some transplant tissue that, you know, was contaminated, things were starting to be noticed. In 2005, the Daniel George Funeral Home was actually put up for sale and was purchased by an anonymous woman. Hmm. Interesting. Right. (laughs) An anonymous woman. I love this woman already. She's she's there to like kick ass and take names. That's the only exactly. reason. You know what I mean? There's no reason to report that as an anonymous woman other than she came to fuck shit up. Yeah. Okay. So the woman began looking at the paperwork and seeing how the funeral home was run. She was appalled to discover that they were basically running like a human chop shop and none of the paperwork made sense for any of this. So she reported to the police and they began investigating. Documents were subpoenaed from RTI and the funeral home. The more they investigated, the more forgery they found. Well, yeah, they got a 50 year old person that was born in 1927, you know, like he's changing all these dates. Yeah, nothing was adding up. It was just sloppy and. Uh, Yeah, it was just awful. Michael and his lawyer told the ADA, Josh Hanscheft, that he had no knowledge about anyone forging documents. When the ADA spoke to family members of the victims, it became clear that none of the loved ones had given consent for the deceased to be harvested. Oh, man, that would be so horrible to find out. Yeah. You know, that you thought like Aunt Mabel, it was cool, whatever. You know, it was so hard to get to lose her as it is. And then, you know, it's just like insult to injury. So sad. So, so sad. In 2005, the FDA issued a recall on all harvested tissue and organs from biomedical tissue and instructed doctors to test their patients for infectious diseases. During the police investigation, detectives even found surgical gloves and other items sewn up into the bodies. As detectives continued investigating, they eventually found that the organ and tissue donors were not as young and healthy as they were on paper due to forgery on consent paperwork, death certificates, and medical history charts. In 2006, Michael Mastro Marino was arrested for enterprise corruption, reckless endangerment, and theft of a corpse, along with two of his harvesting employees and an embalmer. 
When they were charged, the four men were brought out in handcuffs and all of them shamefully looked at the floor, except for Michael, who looked around at everyone with a cold stare while defiantly chewing gum. He didn't do anything wrong. What do you mean? Oh, this guy is so awful. His lawyer, Mario Gallucci, said he's not Dr. Frankenstein, and his work had only benefited public health, not endangered anyone. I'm sure the patient with hepatitis would agree. Right? Yeah, right. Jesus. Michael was released on bail, and he attempted to spend quality time with family while he was awaiting trial. Ace is the place with the helpful hardware, folks. There's no better feeling than grilling out. And there's no better place than Ace to get the best grill for you and your family. We have the hottest grills from top brands like Big Green Egg, Traeger, and Weber. And since our stores are locally owned and we're committed to helping our neighbors, we'll also assemble and deliver your grill for free. Around the block, what you need in stock with people who know their grills. Offer valid for Ace Rewards members through September 7th on grills and accessories $3.99 and up. See participating stores for scheduling or exclusions. One of the reasons that the story gained traction was because one of the victims was high profile. The British journalist and host of Masterpiece Theater, Alistair Cook, had his arm and leg bones harvested by biomedical tissue services, despite the fact that neither him or his family had consented. And on top of that, he had died of cancer. When reviewing Alistair's documents, detectives noticed that his daughter, Susan Cook Kittredge, was renamed on the documents as Susan Quint. Alistair had also been documented as 10 years younger, and of course, instead of cancer as his cause of death, it was listed as a sudden heart attack. Alistair's daughter, Susan Cook Kittredge, told New York Magazine that if her father knew he would be a victim of organ harvesting, quote, he would have been appalled. It would have given him the shivers. He would have been just horrified. At the same time, he would have appreciated the Dickensian nature of it. <laughs> yeah, he would have. I thought I thought that was kind of cute. Like, yeah, according to his character, like, it would have been upsetting, but he also would have had this little thing in the back of his mind, like, hmm. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) As news spread, people were terrified that this kind of theft could happen to anyone or any person with health issues could end up with contaminated tissue. It's estimated that approximately 1,077 bodies had organs, bones, or tissue that were obtained illegally. It is believed that over 10,000 patients received harvested tissue from Michael's company. Oh, my God. (sighs) Over 12 funeral homes were found to be involved, and it's estimated that Michael made almost $5 million. The scandal had many people questioning whether their loved one had been a victim or if their donor organ was obtained from an unsafe source. Ultimately, the FDA said that they and the CDC believed the risk from the illegally obtained tissues was low. Oh, good. Right? Do I trust that? Makes me feel better. Not so much. Regeneration Technologies Incorporated, or RTI, who had been the main company to purchase organ, bone, and tissue from Michael's company, Biomedical Tissue Services, claimed that there was almost zero risk. Almost Almost. That's not enough. No. Nope. RTI was an accredited tissue bank that also used their patented BioCleanse technology, which the company claims is the only tissue sterilization process that, quote, eliminates viruses, bacteria, fungi, and spores from the tissue without compromising the structural or biomechanical properties. During the BioCleanse process, bones are vacuumed clean of all blood, lipids, and marrow. Then the specimen is completely saturated with chemical sterilants to eliminate 
pathogenic organisms, including HIV, hepatitis B, and C. It is possible that one of the reasons that Michael felt like he could get away with using tissue which did not meet the established criteria was because he knew that BioCleanse was supposed to clean the tissue that thoroughly and make everything safe. That's a great way for him to rationalize it in his head. Exactly. Exactly. You know it's wrong. You know you shouldn't be doing it. It doesn't matter what the cleaning process is. There's certain protocol in place that you're supposed to follow, and you didn't. That's what matters. While the case was in the news, various entities began either distancing themselves or claiming credit for catching him. A company named LifeCell claimed that their own safety protocol had caught Michael's harvesting scam, while the FDA claimed that they had been the ones to discover the issues. At the same time, RTI and other tissue companies were distancing themselves from Michael entirely. In 2008, Michael pled guilty to over 1,300 counts in two states. In New York, he pled guilty to reckless endangerment, enterprise corruption, forgery, and body stealing. He was sentenced in New York to 18 to 54 years. 1,300 counts is a lot. (laughs) I don't recall a case that I've heard of that many, you know? I can't think of any. (laughs) <laughs> Other than like, I mean, the only thing would be like a, a rapist or something or somebody with like sex assault charges, you know, it's like, yeah, really it's prolific just, predator. The, yeah, this is that's, that's the only time the right way to put it. He is a prolific predator. This is just so many people affected so many bodies. He was sentenced in New York to 18 to 54 years. In Pennsylvania, he had similar charges with the addition of deceptive business practices, criminal conspiracy, and abuse of a corpse. He was sentenced there to an additional concurrent 25 to 58 years in Pennsylvania. Michael had maintained his innocence for the couple years since his arrest. So it was only around this time where he pled guilty that Michael's wife, Barbara, found out that Michael was actually guilty. His wife, Barbara, said, quote, when it first hit the news, he said, Barb, this isn't going to go well. He kept saying, there's a bigger fish here. They're trying to get somebody. They're pressing me. And we all believed him. My family, his family, we all believed him. The bottom line is, I didn't really know that he was guilty of everything until I sat in the district attorney's office with him while he was already incarcerated. Throughout the entire time, I had the belief that he couldn't have been guilty of it all. Denial. Just unbelievable. Unbelievable. And he's still trying to say, like, there's a bigger fish here. It's not me. They're going after somebody else. I'm not guilty. Don't worry, Barb. I would never do that. You know me, right? Right. <laughs> but like she you know doesn't me, the know guy him. with the needle in his arm that cheats on you. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't know this guy. At all. Yeah, it's terrible. And I just yeah, I the kind of denial and codependency and I I do feel bad for her, you know. I think there's just something going on that she she just couldn't see it, you know. Yeah even right in front of her face. And I hope that she's gotten a lot of therapy since then. Me too. Michael was ordered to pay $4.6 million to the district attorney's office to be distributed among the victim's relatives. His wife, Barbara, was concerned that she could be punished for her husband's wrongdoings. And I guess it's worth clarifying. I mean, they're, they're, was plenty of assets seized during this time for the 4.6 million. You know, they took the house, they did all these things. But Barbara was really worried about families coming after her. You know, she was worried about people being upset and she knew that they had a right to be, you know, pretty pissed at him. 
She said, quote, when everything came to light, I was actually afraid of any loved ones reaching out to me simply because I understood their anger. If you put yourself in their position, how could you not be so distraught with anger that you just want to lash out? Since he was in prison, I was worried. I'm still very sorry. I can't imagine what they're going through every day. Once Michael admitted his guilt, Barbara decided to divorce him. But she did encourage her sons to maintain a relationship with their father if they wanted to. Okay. So funeral home owner Joseph Nicelli was also charged and pled guilty to over 100 counts, including body stealing, corruption, reckless endangerment, forgery, and unlawful dissection of a corpse. Joseph was sentenced to 8 to 24 years and was paroled in 2015. The Cutters, Chris Alderazi and Lee Crusetta, faced similar charges. Lee pled guilty and was sentenced to 8 to 24 years and was also paroled in 2015. But Lee was the person who kind of showed the most remorse out of any of these guys. And in jail, he wrote letters to the victim's family members, as well as the donor tissue recipients. He really wanted to apologize, offer condolences, and answer any questions that they might have that could possibly bring the victims some sort of peace or closure. Okay, I'm okay with that. Right. I mean, he knew that what he did was wrong. I mean, he the whole time said, I just got caught up in this thing and and I really, really fucked up and I feel really bad. The rest of them didn't seem to share that sentiment at all. (laughs) Yeah, he was the one that had the wife who lost a job and had four kids and had to do something in desperate times call for desperate measures. I I mean, if he's writing letters to not only the families, but then also like to try to answer questions for them, that's remorse. Yeah. He really, I think, was just backed up into a corner and then got in too deep. You know, yeah. he was, he probably joined, he was a, the first one, as far as I understand, to be brought onto the team. And maybe Michael was operating on the up and up at the time, or maybe Michael was doing the illegal ones himself and then giving Lee the ones that were legal. I mean, I don't know. So maybe at first it was fine and then slowly it, it started to fall apart and he it was just kind of too late for him or something. Yeah. But he really, really took it to heart and wanted to make amends and fix it, you know. Chris refused a plea and opted for a bench trial facing a judge instead of a jury. The judge found him guilty of 20 charges, then sentenced him to 9 to 27 years, but he was also paroled in 2015. Michael died of complications from liver cancer, which metastasized to his bones at age 49 in July of 2013, while he was still serving his prison sentence. When Michael passed, his ex-wife Barbara said, quote, Personally, it was a moment of relief for me. It was sad that it had come to all of this, but to me, it kept my children and actually the world safer. That's the way I saw it. I saw myself being out of danger as well as my children, and because he had such a brilliant, keen mind, it was dangerous. It was a dangerous mind. Wow. And that's the story of Michael Master Marino. That's a wild ride. The body snatcher of Brooklyn. All I could think about, too, I mean, not all, but in the beginning, I was thinking about this, and I'm like listening to all the kidney issues, right? I'm like, Selena Gomez, her friend gave her a kidney, right? Right. She has lupus, I think? Yeah, I think so. And yeah, that's the thing is like, this is a common thing that people need some sort of tissue, organ, transplant, bone, anything, you know, this isn't really that uncommon. I think eventually, you know, we'll all have someone in our family that needs something, you know? Well, we just had, we had this exact conversation uh, about how 
I was freaking out. Like, couple, you know, I wasn't exactly better yet. And we were talking just, oh, what, did, what happened, Court? And I was telling you, you know, I had a couple blood transfusions. How many? Just a couple. Five. <laughs> two bags of platelets. You know, all these things. And I know everything. And like you had said, you were so funny and smart. And you're like, I don't even, I'm not going to tell you how much they filter blood and how nothing's going to happen because that's not what you need to hear right now. And I was like, you're right. You just need to listen to me tell you that I'm terrified that one of these days something's going to happen. What if it's a different type of blood and it just all of a sudden on a Thursday decides today's the day I'm going, you know, and this isn't going to happen, but this is like what I've been thinking about because after listening to this, now I'm like, oh my God, this just happened to me, you know, and it, right. so my wheels were turning and oh, it's just good stuff. So yeah, I mean... <laughs> This, this is something happen. that affects so many people, you know? If you are listening right now, then you know Courtney, and you know someone that's needed, you know, uh, a transfusion, that's yeah. needed, you know, body, <laughs> uh, you know, a donation from someone else, Yeah, basically. So, I mean, we, I feel like we all know that it's happening. We all know that there's a necessity for people to be donors. There's a necessity for people's bodies to be harvested. However, we need to make sure that it's done in an appropriate, safe manner. And when it's not, and when it's done just for profit, and it's done in unsanitary and unethical conditions, I mean, it's just devastating and traumatic and dangerous, you know? Yes. But, I mean... If he was operating on the up and up, I mean, this could be something that could make a huge difference in people's lives, a positive difference. But instead, he was greedy and he just took whatever he wanted, you know? Yeah. But there's so many people out there that could benefit from maybe more aggressive donor campaigns out there. Like there's commercials for everything, you know? Tell me about how I should be a donor, you know? <laughs> like... Yeah. I don't know. I it's, think that would be uh, something good to to get, I don't know, more awareness out there. I, I mean, and until it touches you, you don't really, you just kind of turn a blind eye. It's easy to not think about, right? You know, yeah. but like when something happens to someone close to you, then it becomes a bigger deal. You know, I mean, I know that like I, I encourage people to be on the marrow registry because my niece passed from leukemia. You know, when something is personal, you spread the word. But I mean, maybe this is the kind of story where the lesson is that maybe more of us need to put some thought into being donors because we can make a difference in our death. There's more that can be done. If that's something that you're open to, maybe think about it because there's people out there that need it. Or donate blood. You know someone now that needed transfusions. Maybe think about donating blood, you know? Yeah, I think donating blood is like the most immediate way that you can definitely like make a real difference. Absolutely. For sure. I've always, you know, just donating blood is just like a really noble cause to me. And then like yeah. needing it, you know, it was just... It's been a really weird two months, everybody, <laughs> like, know, in this right? head, as you can imagine. So thank you for going on this journey. I'm a weird person that like, so I've tried to like donate blood or marrow and like all this stuff, whatever. But because I've had so many surgeries, I never meet this threshold where they're like, I can't remember exactly what it is, but they're like, you have to be X amount of time past a surgery before you can donate. So they know that you're in whatever health con condition is okay, you know? Yeah. And so, like, I've tried to donate and they're like, oh, you can't. So even, like, for example, when my niece was sick, I couldn't donate because I had just had surgery a couple months prior, you know? So, I mean, there's just a lot of ways that you can help and having the awareness of, you know, if you meet the criteria and what can be done, like blood is a great way to start. Um, but I don't know, consider being a donor, you know, there's hearing all these statistics of how many people are in need is just jarring. And if we can be of some help, it's worth thinking about. I agree. Well, the next one's going to be equally as horrific. So, you know, 
Don't worry about that, everybody. <laughs> Organs. It's yeah. gross. Yeah. So um, this is a rough letter, but we're going to get through it. And yeah, I'm just gonna... whose idea was this anyway? <laughs> Yours. <laughs> it. it just was. Oh my god! It was just the best thing for O. Oh, and it's just, I really wanted the person waking up in the ice missing a kidney. So send yeah, it over. So, send it over to me, please. Please, those cases, if you can find them, let us know. If they're confirmed, not urban legends. Please let us know, because otherwise we actually are only going to do two cases for organ theft because it's it's a little bit much for us and there's not a whole lot to find out there. So unless someone else can supply another case, we're going to breeze through letter O very quickly. Perfect. <laughs> So yeah, before we get out of here, just remember to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want some merch, we've got Threadless. Check out um, our Threadless for just, you know, cups, t-shirts, tote bags, all that sort of stuff. And we've got a Patreon and we're working on more bonuses. That's kind of one of the major things that we've been doing in our downtime. So we've got some episodes that are kind of ready to record. So those should be coming up pretty soon. And we want to say thank you to the people that joined our Patreon. So thank you to Kelly, Keisha, Pamela, Aurora, Trey, Anne, and Samantha. Thank you, everyone. We see you. We love you. Get in the group. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, we appreciate you. Please come join us. Talk to us. Be in our Facebook groups and pages and join us on Instagram and talk to us. And um, if I didn't read your name, just know that it's coming. It's coming. Ne- next week, I'll get to you. Got gotcha. you. <laughs> and I think that's pretty much it. That's you it. Got we got any go. other announcements? I know. I, I'm, I got to take a shower now. I got so worked up. <laughs> I'm freaking out oh, on these gross organs. in here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, you guys. We hope to see you next week. Have a great week. Until then. And we'll see you later. See ya. Bye.